warm welcome uh, to the service this morning. Such a long time since I've been here on a Sunday morning. I'm looking at you all. I'm trying to discern who you are behind these masks. Uh, I know there's visitors here, so a particular warm welcome to visitors uh, who are here uh, this morning uh, as well. Uh, one or two notices. There is, of course, the uh, evening service. It's the evening service of both churches, but it's always held across the road in Cap Trinity, and it's at 630 on Monday, you have a prayer time uh, eight, between 8 and 9 on Zoom. And then on Wednesday, there's the 10.30 uh, service. I'm calling it the booster service because we're all, at least if you're my age, we're all into getting boosters. And I think we don't just need COVID vaccine boosters. We need spiritual boosters. And so it's nice in the middle of the week. It's been nice to see that service growing uh, week by week. So I do encourage you to come along. Uh, the prayer breakfast will be on Saturday, 9 to 10, and we'll be on Zoom. And then next Sunday service at 11 is a service with communion. Uh, and those on Zoom are reminded if they want to take communion, they need to prepare what they need in their own homes. So we're here uh, this morning to worship God. So let's begin by singing together Lord, I come before your throne of grace. Okay, let's uh, pray together. Our gracious and our loving God, we bow our hearts before you. You are our God. We thank you that you're the God who, even before the beginning of time, you who we are. And before the beginning of time, you had made plans. Plans that we might find salvation and forgiveness, peace, hope, and joy in Jesus. We thank you, gracious Lord, for your intimate care of us, for your love for us. For the way you love us forever. For your love is an unconditional love. We thank you for the gift of Jesus, but also the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, gracious Lord, for giving him to us and for his quiet working in our lives. For the times past, before we found Jesus as our Savior, he would be hovering around, knocking on the door of our hearts, seeking to soften us, that we might begin to hear your word and respond to the gospel. Lord, you are a faithful God, faithful to yourself, faithful to your own nature, but also faithful to your word and faithful to your promises. We thank you, Lord, as we look into our Bibles. There's hardly a page, but has a promise for us. Something we can hold on to. Something we know you will keep. Because you are a true God. Honest and right, faithful in every respect. Lord, forgive us for our sin. Forgive us for our personal obsessions. Forgive us, Lord, that we allow things from the world in which we live to creep into our minds, <coughs> closing down our thinking so that we, we don't hear you. We don't see Jesus as he needs to be seen. And we become obsessed with ourselves and with our own situations, with our own problems. Forgive us today for the many, many times we've stood away, turned away, closed our ears, become obsessed with ourselves. Cleanse us, Lord, of that. Set us free from that. And pray today as we dig into your word, word you will cut away any unhealthy obsessions from our lives. And help us simply be men and women who are obsessed with you, obsessed with Jesus, 
to come and be with us today. Forgive us for all our sin, for words spoken in haste, for thoughts allowed to linger that should have been driven from our minds as soon as they appeared, for things, Lord, left undone that we should have done in recent days, for things done that we shouldn't even have come close to doing. Forgive us for all our sin, for attitudes and priorities that miss what we ought to be as your people. So please, gracious Lord, forgive us for all our sin and open us to you. And bless us this morning as we pray in Jesus' own words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to sing again in the song, Seek Ye First the Kingdom of God. Our reading this morning is in Luke's Gospel and chapter 12 and at verse 13, 13 to 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, that's Jesus, teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. <laughs> and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you will get what you have prepared for yourself. This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Amen. I'm presuming you've been preaching through a bit of Luke's gospel up till now, or is it just certain bits you've been doing? Yes. Just certain bits. So you haven't preached a bit just before this bit? No. <laughs> I should have checked on that before we began, shouldn't I? The bit before this bit then, <laughs> Jesus is very busy challenging the people, getting them to focus on the things they should be focusing on. He's warned them about the Pharisees and how they will divert you from really focusing upon God. He's been getting them to focus on things like the care that God has for them and the love that God has for them. Like if a sparrow falls to the ground, God sees that because God cares. He's been getting them to focus on the work of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit's working, and we need to open our lives to the Holy Spirit. He's been focusing on these kind of things up to this point in Luke's Gospel. But then, as we begin today's little portion, somebody comes along, and it's as if, he hasn't heard a single thing that Jesus has been saying. And the reason he hasn't heard a single thing that Jesus has been saying is because he is obsessed. And today's message 
is about obsession. This wee man is obsessed with money. Now, does that hit anybody between the eyes? Is there anybody here this morning that is obsessed with money? You see, there's Jesus trying to teach good things, big things, important things to the people who have gathered around him. And this man comes charging forward and says, just a minute, just a minute, I've got a question. I want you to do something for me. I want you to sort out my brother. I want you to sort him out because my father died recently and he's not divided the inheritance properly. And I need you to sort that for me. He's obsessed with money. Somebody said, when it comes down to inheritance, when somebody special in your life has died, whenever there is an inheritance, this person said, 99% of people become wolves. You've been in a situation where there's been family trouble, over an inheritance. It's very often there. Very often happens. I was brought up by my auntie, my mother's sister. And I remember one of her aunties died. And she and her cousin were to sort out all the stuff in the house that was left. And they were going to take what they fancied themselves and then get rid of the rest to charity shops or whatever. But my auntie lived in Kelso and the cousin lived in Galashiels and the person who died lived in Galashiels. So the house was in Galashiels and my auntie had been up looking things over before they even started dividing things. But when she went back, there was a pair of kit gloves that weren't there. And the cousin must have taken them. And that pair of kid gloves would have been a rankle in my auntie's heart until we said, come on, what does a pair of kid gloves matter if it's distorting your heart? And so she gave it up and let it go. But here's a wee man whose life is destroyed at the moment because he can't get over the fact that when the money was divided, he didn't think it was divided fairly. When he goes to bed at night, he's thinking about that money. When he gets up in the morning, he's thinking about that money. He can't stop thinking about the money that he believes should have been his. It's not fair, Jesus. Would you please sort this out? Tell my brother to divide it properly with me. He's totally fixated, obsessed with the issue of money. And that's become a bitterness. It's become a soul-destroying thing in his heart and in his life. That's what some obsessions do for us. They destroy us. They hurt us. And so there he is. Leo Tolstoy, the famous writer, wrote a story. Now, this is just a story. It's not a true story. It's just a story. But it's a good story. It was a story about a man who was told that for a thousand rubles, he could buy all the land he could walk around in one day. So the man set off first thing in the morning, went as fast as he could and as far as he could. By midday, he was getting kind of tired, but he kept going on and on. And he quickened his pace because he saw the sun was going down. He thought, I've got to get back to the start or it will not count. So he started running as fast as he could to get back to the start. But when he got back to the start, he dropped dead, blood streaming from his mouth. Afterwards, the story says, his servants dug him a grave, not much more than six feet long 
and three feet wide. Tolstoy ends his story by saying, all a man really owns is six by three piece of ground. You're better putting your confidence somewhere else than in the fixation with money. This wee man could only think of money, money, money. And because he thinks only of money, he thinks wrongly about Jesus. You see, it was a custom in those days, if you had a problem, you went along to a rabbi, and the rabbi would listen to you and try to sort out your problem for you. And that's what this man thinks about Jesus. It's just a rabbi. He'll somebody who'll sort things out for me. That's all he thinks. He's not thinking, this is Jesus. This is the Son of God. This is the Savior of the world. This is the person who can secure my future and my eternity. No, oh, it's just a rabbi. You see, his obsession blinds him to the reality of Jesus. It's folks like that today. Jesus is a very good example. He'll show you how to be nice and good. Jesus, oh, he teaches really, really good things if you look there, but that's as far as it goes. You don't see who Jesus really is. The Muslims believe in Jesus, but just as a prophet. The Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons believe in Jesus, but not as God, not as the Son of God, as a, a slightly lower rung than God person. They don't see who Jesus really is. And that's what obsessions do for us. They limit how we see who Jesus is. This man didn't see who Jesus really was. Did you hear what Jesus said to him? Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Listen to Jesus' warning. Somebody wrote, we spend more, but have less. We buy more, but we enjoy it less. We have bigger houses and smaller families, more conveniences, but less time, more medicine, but less wellness. We read too little, watch TV too much, pray too seldom. We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. These are times of tall men and short character, steep profits and shallow relationships. These are the days of two incomes, but more divorce, of a fancier house, but broken homes. We've learned how to make a living, but not a life. We've added years to life, but not life to years. We've cleaned up the air, but polluted the soul. Not sure we've cleaned up the air, actually, either there, but never mind. You get the point, don't you? And it's right. It's where greed has taken us. And so Jesus here warns the man and us, about the power of greed to stop your ears hearing the truth, to stop you seeing Jesus for who he really is. He warns them here that there's a lot more to life than money. But folks are still obsessed with the lottery. 
and the scratch cards and the postcode lottery and all. If I can just, if I could just win it, everything would be fine. Get a life, Jesus says. Money doesn't make it fine ever. Somebody said, poverty wants much, greed wants everything. One of the weaknesses of our age is the inability to distinguish between need and greed. He who seeks more than he needs hinders himself from enjoying what he has. And so the first warning this morning in this passage concerns obsession with money. Does that strike a, a blow to any of us this morning? If we allow that to become our obsession, we allow a closing down of our sensitivities to the things of God. Now, to help the wee man deal with this, Jesus tells him a story. But before we're allowed to hear that story again, we're going to sing. Because I know you like two-part sermons in this church. So we're having the second part in a wee minute. Meanwhile, we're going to sing as the deer. And we're singing it with the music this time. So get ready to belt it out nice. So Jesus told them this parable. The ground of a certain man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things, laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, 
drink and be merry. But God said, um, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Obviously, the story clicks in very clearly with what the man who'd come to Jesus to talk about is. The obsession is perhaps slightly different this time, though very clearly connected. The man was obsessed with money. The man in this story is obsessed with himself. Now, that's a huge temptation for most of us. Because if we're honest, most of us, the person we like best, as ourselves, and it's very easy to be completely obsessed with just yourself. So Jesus tells a story of this rich fool. He is completely obsessed with himself. His thinking is very similar to the wee man that came to Jesus at the beginning of our section. He's thinking only of himself. It's a story of a rich man, a farmer, who has a bumper crop. He's already very rich, but this harvest is the cream and the cake. This is going to give him everything he could ever want or desire. From this day on, once he's built his grand, big new barn, he'll not need to think about doing another day's work. Now, he's not a bad man. There's no hint that he's got his riches be being bad. We're not told that he became rich because he stole. We're not told that he fiddled his tax returns. We're not told that he was bad to his laborers. We're not told of anything. All we're told is that he had done very, very well for himself and everything was done. He's not a particularly bad man, except he's fixated by one thing, himself and his own comfort. The thought that God might have been involved in that bumper harvest doesn't enter his head. The thought that he should maybe stop and praise God for this blessing that's come into his life, that doesn't enter into his head. The thought that he could use this abundance to help all kinds of people have a better or a happier life. Doesn't he enter his head? The only thing that enters his head is himself and what he can do for himself. He's totally obsessed with himself. Somebody wrote, he who lives only to benefit himself confers on the world a benefit when he dies. Human history is the sad result of each person looking out for himself. So here's a man obsessed with himself. Is that a challenge to any of us this morning? He's a man who thinks only of what he can do. When the bumper crop comes along, he begins to make his plans. And the, the little story here is peppered with the word I, I, I. This is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns. I will store up my grain. I'll say to myself, I. He's totally fixated with himself. Occasionally the word my creeps in as well, but that's not much difference from I. Is it totally obsessed 
with himself. One of my daughters has a huge big painting in one of her rooms, and it's covered with the word me in all shapes and sizes, hundreds of me's painted all over this picture. And if you stare at it for a while, you eventually see there's one word, tiny, and then somewhere in the painting, the word you. Everything, me, me, me. Just one we, you. So easy to become people that are obsessed with ourselves. He's a man who thinks only of the now, isn't it? I'll pile it all up and then I can sit back, eat, drink, and be merry. He thinks just of now. Doesn't think beyond today. What I can have today. We become an instant generation, haven't we? We want everything now. We don't want to wait any longer. We need everything now. But notice this. Notice this man who is obsessed with himself has forgotten there is a God. Suddenly, in the midst of his self-absorption with himself, God speaks to him. <gasps> God exists. God's speaking to me. What's God saying? God's real. Well, I haven't given God a thought. I haven't given him any space in my life. Nor, the Bible says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So easy to obsess with ourselves. Forget there is a God. How foolish it is if we forget that one simple thing. So obsessed by himself, he had no thought of God. Millions in our country live as if there is no God. But there is. This man thought only of himself. And forgot about God. This man thought only of what he could do. And forgot there is one thing only God can do. What will I do for myself? I'll build a bigger barn. I'll pile it all out. I'll have every single thing I could possibly need. Except he needs salvation. And he needs forgiveness. And he needs hope. And the money is not going to help with that. The riches that he enjoys is not going to help with that. Because there's one thing we cannot do. We cannot save ourselves. Only God can. Only Jesus can save us. This man so obsessed with what he could do, he forgot the one thing he could not do. He could not save himself. And this man so obsessed with himself, thinking only of the now, what I can have today, Forgot there is a tomorrow and there is an eternity. He forgot what the Bible teaches us elsewhere. It is appointed unto every man and woman once to die. But after that, the judgment. Because he thought only of the now. He forgot about the judgment. He forgot about death. He forgot about eternity. He had made no preparations for that. And preparations for that have to be done now because you don't know 
if there'll be a tomorrow. This man didn't get his tomorrow. He's obsessed with his own pleasure now, but not with dealing with his eternity now. This man who thought only of the now and completely forgot about eternity. Somebody said, greed is the logical result of the belief there is no life after death. We grab what we can, while we can, however we can, and then hold on to it hard. But none of it prepares us for eternity. So here's two men in this little passage, both obsessed, almost interlinked obsession. One utterly obsessed with money, the second utterly obsessed with himself. God said to them, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich to God. What does God want you to be obsessed with? Jesus slips it in quietly there, doesn't he? God wants us to be obsessed with pleasing God, with getting right with God. Jesus doesn't condemn the riches. He doesn't condemn them for being rich. Riches is a blessing if you're blessed with that. He doesn't condemn material riches. But he does encourage us to get a balance. The riches we need to be obsessed with is not how much we have in the bank, but how much we have stored up in heaven. And what can we have stored up in heaven but salvation, but trust in Jesus, by commitment to him, by making sure our salvation, our eternity is secure because we have put our faith in the Lord Jesus. Psalm 37 verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. We sang these words. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things, everything else you could possibly need will be added to you. We need the riches stored up for us in heaven, the faith that God gives us to trust in Jesus, the grace that he gives us because none of us will deserve it and we come leaning on that truth, the knowledge of the love of God in our lives and our commitment to him in all we do. Make sure this morning you're rich in heaven, in the things that please God. The challenge this morning is, what is your obsession? Money? Yourself? Or God. God wants us to be obsessed with being right with him. And that's only possible when we put our trust in the Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Our gracious and our loving God, Sometimes the things we find in your word are hard for us because they reveal us 
for what we are. So easy, Lord, for any of us to be like these two men. We need money. We know we need money. We can't live without it. But when it takes over our minds, it destroys us. And when all we think of from day to day is ourselves, so much is left undone. People left to wallow in their own grief and hurt and loneliness because we didn't notice. Forgive us, Lord, if any of these things have begun to creep into our lives and divert us from you. It's you we need. We need to be fixated with you. Help us, Lord, turn our minds away from ourselves and our everyday lives and look to you and make sure we're right with you. Thank you for this amazing gospel that you prepared. Before the foundation of the world, you had it all set in action. And so Jesus came and did all that was necessary for our salvation when he took our place and our punishment upon the cross, when he experienced the judgment of God on himself so that we who trust him might be free from such things. Thank you for this gospel, Lord, that simply asks that we trust you, put our faith in you, open our hearts to you. So easy, so simple, so clear. Pray for the gospel as it goes forth today throughout our world. Praying there'll be those, Lord, whose hearts are turned to you, who leave behind the worldly concerns that have obsessed them and come running into the arms of a welcoming Jesus and to know forgiveness. Pray that for any here today who've not yet closed in with Jesus and their lives. Bless us, Lord. Continue to bless the church across the road as they meet and continue to meet this morning. Bless them there. Bless Wilma as she has a break. Thank you for a refresher, renewer, inspirer, equipper. Continue to bless her in this place of ministry. And bless this congregation as we look to the future and look to the best way to reach out into this community. So bless us. Lord, bless our nation. We're a nation that has known so much good from you in our history, times of rich spiritual blessing. And yet today, millions turn their back, close down their souls, refuse to think. We cry to you for you to come and bless. Bless those in leadership, Lord. So many of the top folks don't seem to think very much about you. They don't ask, what would you do? They do what they want to do. We need leaders, Lord, that would be open to you and open to your blessing. So, Lord, bless those in leadership and turn them to yourself. We thank you for our Queen. We thank you for the example she set so clearly of our faith in Jesus. Pray that that would continue to be a challenge to our own family and to the leaders of our nation. And that you would bless her in these days of increasing old age and weakness. Bless her. Pray, gracious Lord, for the church for the church worldwide, in some parts of the world, growing, vibrant, thrilling, in others, struggling to hold on, in other places, crushed, broken, as persecuted Christians suffer severely for just loving you. And Lord, we think of the needs of our world. We think of all these refugees all over the world, 87 million refugees. 24,000 come to the British shores just this year alone. 
people fleeing from persecution, from poverty, from famine. Okay, some are cheating, as it were, just looking for something better, but most of them needy folks. Lord, we cry to you that you would raise up men and women throughout the world who care for those in such a situation. We thank you it's not new to you, for Jesus became a refugee. He knows what it's like. So we pray for his presence and his blessing to be in all these refugee camps, wherever they are at this time. And bless all the NGOs and governments who are seeking to do their best to help with this situation. And of course, there's still nations that have been broken with the effects of climate change and forest fires and earthquakes and all these kind of disasters that happen from time to time. And there are still nations struggling with war and violence and evil. We can only ask for your power and your presence to be there. And so, Lord, we think of all these big things, but we thank you that you're not just the God of the big things, but of the little things, of the ordinary things of things in our own lives where we need your help, where we're a bit lonely or where we're depressed or where things haven't worked out quite as we'd hoped and we've been let down, where there's trouble within our families or at our work. Pray for your help, Lord, for your ministry. So bless. And of course, we pray for Catherine, working away there in Spain, Continue to bless her, encourage her. Lord, she touches the lives of a group of women. And in some sense, you might think that's not very much. But there's not one woman who is not precious to you. And if that woman can be one for Christ, then it's great. So bless her today, uplift her and encourage her. And Imran in Pakistan, too, as he ministers to the Afghan refugees that have fled into Pakistan. So bless him. So meet with us this morning. Whatever our need, come and encourage us. Lift our spirits and help us engage personally with you today. In Jesus' name. Amen. And we close our service with uh, the hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be.
may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with each one of you, now and forevermore. Amen.